So the concept of a limit for a multivariable function is basically the same as for a single variable function. So for a single variable function, then the domain and the image are both on the real number line. So if we can make f of x as close as we want to some value l by restricting the x value to some interval around this point a, so that for all of the x values inside this interval around a, except at a itself, then the value of the function is very close to l. And then we say that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to l. So now let's look at how this carries over to a multivariable function. So if we have some function from a squared to a1, which would be you know, a typical function which takes in an x and a y and outputs a z value, well, we have the same idea, except that our domain is now two-dimensional. So the input, instead of approaching a single x value, it's going to be approaching a point on this domain. So again, if we can make the value of the function as close as we want to this number l by restricting the input values to some interval around this point a, b, then we say that the limit as x, y approaches a, b of the function is equal to l. Except notice that now, since our domain is two-dimensional, Instead of just an interval around some point, we have a disk around the point. So if this limit exists, then we must be able to make some disk around the point a, b, such that for all of the values of x and y inside this disk, the value of the function is very close to l. So you can see that it's basically the same idea, just with a two-dimensional domain. So in this video, we're not going to go over the formal definition of a limit. We're going to look at how to prove that a limit does not exist. So the key thing with multivariable limits is that as we approach this point a, b in the domain, the function must always approach the value l, no matter how or what path we use to approach a, b. So oftentimes, when we're evaluating limits, then we choose a specific path to approach the point A, B on, because it's easy to calculate it that way. So no matter what path we take to approach this point A, B, the value of the function has to approach the same value. So this is similar to how in single variable limits, you know, the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit must be the same. The limit must be the same whether you approach from the right or from the left. So it's the same idea except that in a two-dimensional domain we can approach from many different ways than just right and left. So if you're trying to prove that a limit does not exist, then all you have to do is find one path to the point where the function has a different limit than what is expected. So here we have a multivariable function, and we want to see if the limit as x, y approaches 0, 0 exists. First of all, obviously we can see that direct substitution is not going to work. So the, the function is undefined at 0, 0. So we need to choose a path to approach this point on in the domain. So first, let's try to approach along the x-axis. Remember, the domain of this function is in the x-y plane. So approaching along the x-axis would look something like this, if this is a picture of our domain. So along the x-axis, the y-value of the function is always a 0. So if we plug in 0 for y in the function, we get this. And of course, the limit as x-y approaches 0, 0 of this function is 0. So we have 0 as a possible candidate for the limit of this function. Now let's try 
approaching along the y-axis. So along the y-axis, the x value is always equal to 0. So if we plug in 0 for x in this function, then we get this. And of course, the limit is still equal to 0. So, so far, we have two paths which have the same limit of 0. But that's not enough to say that the limit exists. So we're going to keep trying more, more paths. So let's try approaching along the line y equals x. So along this line, we can replace all the y's with x's, or the other way around. So replacing all the y's with x's gives us this, which is always equal to 1 half. So if the function is always equal to 1 half, then obviously the limit as xy approaches anything is going to be 1 half. So the limit as xy approaches 0, 0 of the function, if we approach the point along this line, y equals x, is equal to 1 half, not 0. So since we have found a path which has a limit different than in another path, then we know that the limit does not exist, because the limit must be the same across all possible paths. So proving that a limit does not exist usually follows the same type of pattern. You keep trying different paths to approach the point. So you know, oftentimes you'll start with the x-axis and the y-axis, and then you can choose different lines, such as y equals x, or you can approach along a parabola. If we wanted to approach the point 0, 0 along the parabola y equals x squared, we replace all the y's in the function with x squared, and then we can divide by x squared in the top and bottom, and so the limit is going to be 0. So the limit along this parabola agrees with the first two limits that we found. However, we already know that the limit does not exist because one path had a different limit. So you just keep trying different paths until you find one that's different. And if you want to prove that a limit does exist, then you have to use the formal definition of a limit. But some functions allow us to evaluate limits easily if they are continuous. So the definition of continuity is very similar to that of a single variable function. So a function from r squared to r1 is continuous at a point in the domain ab if the limit as xy approaches ab of the function is equal to the value of the function at ab. And some types of functions are always continuous wherever they are not undefined. So these include, you know, polynomials, trigonometric functions, logarithms, exponential functions. So those are very easy usually to find the limit of since they are continuous everywhere. And if we have some continuous functions f and g, then these functions are also continuous. We can add them, multiply them, divide them, as long as g is not equal to 0, multiply them by a constant, and take the composition of these functions. So performing any of these operations on two continuous functions will yield another continuous function. So here's a limit of a function with three input variables, but we notice that the top is a polynomial, and then the bottom is made up of a polynomial and a exponential function, and all of these are continuous. And so we are dividing a continuous function on the top by a continuous function on the bottom, so this whole thing is continuous, which means that we can just evaluate the limit by directly substituting the values of x, y, and z. So all you have to do is plug in the numbers and simplify. And so this is the limit of the function. So if we have a vector-valued function with multiple outputs, then to find the limit of the function, we just find the limits of each output individually. So let's say we have this function here. The input is x and y, and then the output is these three separate functions. So if we want to find the limit as x, y approaches 2, 1, then we find the limit as x, y approaches 2, 1 of each individual output function. These are called the component functions of the vector value function. 
So you just evaluate all the limits individually. And note that if one of the component functions does not approach a limit, then the limit of the function as a whole does not exist. So the limit is just the vector containing the limits of each of the component functions.